What's up everybody, welcome to Podcast Now, I'm Alex, and I'm here today to review The Smashing Pumpkins, Melancholy, and The Infinite Sadness. Uh, we've been doing these reviews recently, we've already reviewed Gish, we've reviewed Siamese Dream, and we've reviewed Pisces Iscariot, so now it's time to review the double album, the really, really big one. Now, I was thinking when I was going into this review, should I split it up, should I do one side, the first CD, uh, one review, and then do the second CD, the other? I'm not going to do that. It's going to be an enormously long video that's going to hurt the video overall, I think, in terms of watch time and views, but at the same time, I think only people that watch Smashing Pumpkins or like them, maybe one other person, uh, would even watch this video. So I'm just going to go through, we're going to do it normally how we always do these Smashing Pumpkins reviews and just album reviews. I'm going to talk about the history of the album. I'm going to talk about what kind of went into it. I'm going to talk about its sounds, what I like about it, what I don't like about it. And then we're going to go in and we're going to talk about, we're going to try and talk about every single song on this album. There are 28 songs. That's a lot of songs. So we're just going to, you know, we're just going to jump right in. So Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness released on October 24th, 1995. And was a really, for me, a new sound for the Smash Pumpkins. What I like and what I noticed and what I really started to notice and what I've kind of always noticed is every Smashing Pumpkins album sounds very different. I think that's kind of well known that they all sound pretty different from each other. Other than maybe Gish and Siamese Dream, those have the same kind of sounds. Pisces is scary, you can't really count. It's just B-sides of those albums. But each Smashing Pumpkins album seems to evolve in its own way. Maybe it's not better than the album before. Now, personally for me, I've, you know, I've talked to somebody else about my ranking on the Smashing Pumpkins albums, and I would honestly put Melancholy first. That's my opinion. I have a very hard time picking between Melancholy, between Siamese Dream, between Adore, and between Machina 2. Those are my top four, and they rotate all the time. Who's number one? Um, and I would say Melancholy is it right now. Sometimes it's Machina, sometimes it's Adore, sometimes it's Siamese Dream. And what I like about it is, is Melancholy just sounds so different. And really the only time you hear the band in this state, they sound more live. And that's what Billy Corgan actually was talking about. Uh, he, he had like an interview talking about the album, the direction the album went. And he talked about how like they wanted to put in more of their sound when you hear them live. What do they sound like? What are they like live? And they wanted that to be put in the album. They didn't really sound like that before. Gish and Siamese Dream had this very kind of like dreamy, psychedelic sound to it. And Melancholy is just like rock, but gritty and dark. It's definitely more in a way even depressing. And that's Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. That's literally the name. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's a perfect name for this album because it really sounds, it's raw. Some of the songs are very beautiful, but overall the whole album, very raw. Very experimental, but the guitar sounds you hear, Billy's voice, which, you know, this is, I think, where he gets the whole nasally kind of sound from. He's He always had that, but in this album, especially like Bullet with Butterfly Wings, a lot of songs like that, you can, I mean, his voice sounds like we know of Billy Corgan. Um, and I think that comes back again in like Machina 1, which is another time that people had said that. So this album just sounds to me completely different. It was recorded over a very long time. It was recorded right after they got done with the Siamese Dream uh, tour. It was originally going to have, I believe, it re they recorded, I believe, 57 or 54 songs, uh, and it was originally supposed to have 30 songs on the album, or 32, and then they cut it down to 28. So there were more songs. Obviously, the airplanes fly high, looks left, looks right. So that, that was a song that eventually came out when they re-released all these albums. So that's a song that's well known from this era. There's more songs that are from this spot. They even talk about how even in Siamese Dream could have been a double album. Billy Corgan really likes to write music. And, you know, they've talked about that before. Adore was supposed to be or he wanted to be a double album. And I think he had like 44 songs written for that. So he wanted that to, or that could have been. Obviously Machino was fully intended to be a double album. Um, and, and even he's talked recently. So he's always wanted to do this double album thing. And, and Melancholy was when they did that. Melancholy sold incredibly well. This is at the peak of their time. This is obviously right before Jimmy goes into the whole drug addict, their pianoist dies, all that stuff. They have to fire Jimmy Chamberlain from the band. They get a new drummer to kind of finish off their tour and then they go into the Adore era. So this is really it. This is kind of the peak of the Smashing Pumpkins. Whether or not you consider Melancholy their best album, this is definitely the peak of their their sound. Um, it, it changes massively after this, obviously with Adore. So this is it. And this album, again, like I said, 
has so many sounds. It plays, it's got an, a whole instrumental, obviously, opening. Um, it's got the orchestral kind of sound behind it with Tonight Tonight. It's got the gritty, harder rock. It's got some very hard distortion at times. It's got beautiful songs like 1979 and 33, and we're going to talk about all these songs. Um, and then it has a very experiment, and then it goes even more into the, the hard rock, the really just gritty, raw kind of thing. And then it kind of ends very experimental, very much like a preview, I've always thought of it, to the Adore era. Um, so I personally love this album. Now, what I will say about this album is it's not consistent. And why, that's why it doesn't always hold first place. See, I think Machina 2 is more consistent and just has all really, really good songs. And some of those songs on Machina 2 are some of my favorite songs of the Smashing Pumpkins, hands down. Adore, I think, is just so different. And we're going to talk about all these albums as we go along, obviously. But Adore is just so different. And I love all those songs. And then a couple of those songs are really, really good songs. For Siamese Dream, I think Siamese Dream is easily the most consistent, easily the maybe highest quality. Like the, You could tell literally the most effort is put into it. Um, but to me, there's not as many standout songs. No songs truly. I mean, Disarm is really, really good. And Cherub Rock and Today and all that stuff. There's a lot of really, really good songs, and they are way higher than some of the other songs, but it maintains a pretty high level all the time. What I will say with Melancholy, its flaw and also its strength is I think it's got the best Smashing Pumpkin songs besides a couple songs on Machina 2, personally for me, if I were to rank them. And eventually, as we continue this series, once I'm done reviewing the albums, we're going to actually do some rankings, do some music video rankings, do some song rankings. So we're going to be talking about like my favorite songs and all that stuff. but. If you look at Machina 2, some of my favorite songs lie on there. Uh, and then you look at Melancholy, and my songs lie on there too. And we're going to talk about them. But really, the two biggest ones would be 1979 and 33, especially 33. Those two songs are phenomenal songs. Um, they're some of my favorite songs of the Smashing Pumpkins, and they, they mean a lot to me. So they definitely elevate this album. And what I will say is... I don't dis. I only dislike one song in this album. One song. We will get there. Um, but the album is, for the most part, really good. All the songs I enjoy listening to, and it's got pretty good replayability. But the songs are not consistent from one to the next. I will say the second CD is way better than the first. Now the first opens extremely strong, and then kind of fades as we get to the middle part. Whereas the second album starts again extremely strong, then goes super hardcore in the middle, and then goes very experimentational at the end. And I really like that. The second side of this, the, the, you know, the second 14 songs are really, really good and definitely my favorite of the two parts of Malika. Whenever I listen to the first part, I'm like, I'm just going to listen to this a couple times, but I'm really going to listen to the second part because I love the second part. But overall, I mean, I love this album very different. Again, the only real time you hear this kind of music, and you really can tell it's very different. This is the first time since really when they started, they, they dropped Butch Vig, who obviously helped them make Gish, helped them make Siamese Dream. He helped uh, Nirvana, obviously, big time producer, and they dropped him. They added Flood, who obviously would go on to help produce other albums like Adore. So, you know, this album is really the, the last time we see them all together. I think the last song on the album has huge, huge meaning and is really special. Especially listening to it so far ahead, and we're going to talk about that. But especially listening to it now, thinking of back then. Like, this is the last time they're all together. Uh, and the last time, the, and if you think about it, and we talked about this in the Darcy video and all that stuff, this is the last time they're all together. This is it. Because in a door, they don't have Jimmy. And then Machina, they did have Darcy for a little bit, but then she was gone. And then from then on, you know, so this is the last album that all of them were together. And it's got such a unique rock sound that's so good. And, and I do really love this album every time I listen to it. And every time I listen to it, every time I listen to any of those four albums, it elevates itself to number one. And then it will drop once I listen to another album. So overall, phenomenal album. Let's get into each and every one of these songs, and we're going to try and go as fast as we can because there's a lot to cover. Number one, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. Really unique way of starting it. Really bold way of starting it. We had just listened to Siamese Dream. That was the last time we heard of the Smashing Pumpkins, or unless you had, at the time, bought Pisces Iscarius. And 
Melancholy is such an interesting way of kicking it off, all just piano. And it's really good, it's got a really catchy uh, grab to it. And it really, it, I would say it sets the tone, it really connects really well to Tonight Tonight. There's not a lot to say about the first song, other than it's pretty unique, very interesting way of starting it. And it definitely connects to the very end of the album, which we'll talk about as we go along. Number two is Tonight Tonight, one of my favorite songs by them of all time. I love playing on the guitar. It's an incredible song. It's got an incredible meaning, really, of believing in, in another person. Um, obviously, the orchestral thing going on there, they would play that live. They played it like the MTV uh, Awards or whatever, when they won the Grammys and all that stuff that year. They would play, and uh, and they had the, the or you could probably find it on YouTube, too, when, there were, when the three of them are playing, and they, they have the orchestral unit behind them. Very, very cool song. Beautiful. I mean, that's when you first hear his voice, that nasally kind of voice. That's the first time you hear it, um, but it just comes in with such a bang. It's got the rock sound. It's got the catchy uh, rift, really, with just the single note picking for most of the song um, before he goes into the chords. So it, it's such a good song. It's such a good way of starting the album. And then we get to the number three in Jelly Belly, and that song really starts to kick it off. See, Tonight Tonight is still feels raw, especially when you listen to it in the album, but when you listen to Jelly Belly, then it's like, oh yeah, here's just the, the heavy guitar, and that's really what they were doing throughout this whole album was showing people, like, we can take this rock thing, and we can put it up to, like, an 11 out of 10. We, we thought we already had 11 out of 10, but we're moving it up again. Maybe now it's a 12 out of 10. And they even talked about that in the door, how when they were done with Melancholy, they felt there was nowhere else to go with that kind of music. And I completely agree. I do not see how they would have continued this past this. Because Machina is very different than this. So while they did go back to that kind of alternative rock thing, it, it just wasn't the same when they went back to it. This is really the last of it. And this is when they just went all out and just took the risks. Jelly Belly, very good. Again, very, very nasally. Love the guitar, love the drums. Jimmy Chamberlain destroys it with drums throughout the entire album. If he's not as prevalent in it as he was in, I'd say, Siamese Dream or even Gish, a Siamese Dream is really, really a lot about the Billy Corgan, a lot about the 500,000 guitar parts, and really about the drums. Whereas this, this one, the drums are definitely there and they play a key role in a lot of songs, but they're not, I think, they're not in the forefront. And then obviously when we get to Adore, they're, they're not even, it's just a drum machine for some of it, as well as actual people doing it, but it doesn't, it just doesn't uh, go to the forefront of the songs. But Jelly Belly, very strong song. I mean, right in your face. It just, th it, it, it's not like the quiet of this album. Um, but it's pretty darn close. And then we get to Zero, which obviously was another single that they released. Tonight Tonight was the first. And Zero, Zero is a good song. When you ever look at, uh, if you ever looked at YouTube videos of like the, the best riffs of the 90s, that one will always appear um, all the time. Just the classic riff that Zero has. And then obviously the solo, which is just a mishmash of who knows what kind of sound effects and what kind of noises. I've never seen somebody in like a cover or a, or a tutorial or whatever. I've never seen anybody be able to replicate the sound that Billy made on that. Um, but Zero is a fantastic song. Again, very catchy, very heavy, um, a fantastic guitar part, and obviously a, a really a legendary guitar part. And, and it's not even that hard. It's pretty simple. All he's doing is hitting two octaves and then dragging down. So like it's not, it's not that hard, but it's actually a, a phenomenal song. And again, a really good way of starting the album. And then Here Is No Why is number five. Again, starts with a very heavy guitar chord. Starts with some, right after that, obviously goes into like the, the single note like plucking. And that song is really good too. It's got a fantastic, fantastic solo. It's one of my favorite solos, I think, that they've ever done. Um, and it's really the first time that you hear a solo. Jelly Belly kind of has one, but not really. Zero has one, but it's just noises, and Tonight Tonight doesn't have one. So Here Is No Why is the first time you hear it. And, it, you know, they never went back to the insane guitar things they would do in, in terms of solos um, back in Gish and Siamese Dream. They kind of messed with it a little bit in Machina, and Machina was a little bit like that, but it definitely was pulled back a little bit. And even in Melancholy, they do not rely on the crazy guitar shreds that Billy Corgan can do. He could still do them at the time, he can still do them now, but they didn't rely on it as much. And then we get to Bullet with Butterfly Wings, and 
what can you really say about that song that hasn't been said, right? Again, one of my favorite songs ever. Um, definitely in my top five, top ten songs that they've ever made. The World is a Vampire, opening it up and then just getting right into the drums and getting into the guitar. Uh, fantastic. I mean, this song is, one, like I said, one of my favorite songs. So catchy, I, I think. Um, a really, really incredible, very, very powerful, and again, talking again about the music industry, and it's just funny, it's also pretty ironic, people have always said it in his music videos, like when he says, but can you fake it for one more show, for just one more show, and you, the, the irony that he literally sings that, and he's played that song, I believe I looked up one time, like, each song they've ever sang live. And how many times have they done it? I believe Bullet with Butter Butterfly Wings is their most played live song. Oh, and then like 1979 is right after that. So it's just funny that it's talking about this kind of like drawn out nature and this kind of literal fakeness. Like can, can you fake being what you are for just one more show? And it's funny that he literally has to do that every single night. But the song is very powerful, and again, it really, it comes to people like taking from them uh, the the outside music industry, well, the music industry in general, what it has done to them, and how they perceive it. Uh, again, very much like songs they've done uh, on Siamese Dream, and they will eventually touch upon that uh, in the future. But nothing really as clear as Below with Butterfly Wings. Obviously, phenomenal. The guitar parts, the drumming, his screaming. Uh, it's incredible. The song is easily one of my favorite songs ever. And then we get a shift. We get a tonal shift of this album and uh, into the song To Forgive. Heavy, heavy on the bass and the treble. Uh, when I listen to this on, in the car, when I go from Bullet Butterfly Wings, I can put Bullet with Butterfly Wings up pretty high, but then when it goes to To Forgive, you just hear all the speakers just that whole, you know, the like shaking because of how high it is. But To Forgive is very good. I really like it. I like his voice in it. I like that it slows down because really once you are done with the first six songs, counting, maybe once you get to Jelly Belly, you got Jelly Belly, Zero, Here Is No Why, Bill of Butterfly Wings. That is a lot to take in at once. That's a lot to throw at you. You need a break. And this is their break, I think. I think they arranged most of it, most of this album, pretty darn well. And I think there's a lot of meanings to a lot of where they put these songs. I also would say that it's a little bit messy, but we'll talk about that once we get to kind of the end of each album, or each CD. But To Forgive, really good song, not a lot to say about it. This is where it starts to make my point, what I was talking about earlier. It's not, again, the most consistent. To Forgive is definitely lower than these other songs. Then we have an Ode to No One, which was the name written on the album. It was the official name, but it's actually called F.U. with the full word, and I don't really swear, So, but that's, that's the actual name. This one is good. This one's got an insane guitar ending, really. The second half of this is a phenomenal, and it's very, this one is very kind of grunge-heavy rock, and I, I do like it, I do like it, but it just feels like To Forgive is there and it kind of calms you down and then this song just comes on and it's in your face again, it's loud, it's got the really cool guitar part, he just goes crazy by the end of it and it, I don't know, it starts to get a little bit messy. Then Love is next and Love, here's the thing with Love, the distortion of his voice is very interesting, okay? When I first listened to it, I would skip this song. I would skip it. I, I never liked this song. But now I do. Um, I think you just need to follow it along. I think you just need to listen to it enough times. Um, but I do like it. I would say the distortion is very off-putting. I would say that I don't know why that he arranged this part of the album the way he does. It gets messy here. It just does. It's not bad. I wouldn't say it's bad at all. I'd say it's good. I wouldn't say it's like amazing. And we just got done with a really amazing part of the album. And then it kind of goes down. And Cupid De Lock is next. And that is really good, actually. I like this song a lot. I like, it's very short. It's not a long song whatsoever. Um, I like his singing. It's more soft and like peaceful. I like the instruments in the background. Uh, and, I, and I like just the general riff. I like how he talks during it, too. Um, and, and this song is good. This song is definitely like a bounce back song, but still, it's just not that strong. Galapagos is next, and that's a song that's pretty, like throughout history, throughout the Smashing Pumpkins history, pretty well played. He's played that a couple times. This song is good. 
This song I can definitely get behind. Again, it's got a really nice guitar part. I love his voice. I love the actual song. This is definitely when it starts to bounce back. This is kind of an underrated, in my opinion, song because it is really, really good live. He has played it live multiple times in the past. Um, and definitely is is nice. It, it goes in, into the kind of structure of like a Tonight Tonight, at least the opening, not obviously with the orchestra, but with how he plays the guitar. It uh, reminds me of that. But this song is definitely really, really good. A really good bounce back. Muzzle is the next song, and Muzzle is a fantastic song. Muzzle, the guitar, although it's heavy, although it's heavy, very rock-centric, the guitar is not that fast. He never is really playing the guitar that fast at all and he and they played this song quite often they play this on even like late night shows when the album first came out so they really like this song they still played it throughout time i would some for some reason when i first listened to smash bones i would get muzzle mixed up with hummer i would think hummer is muzzle and muzzle was hummer which is really really weird hummer is definitely better of a song um but muzzle is a, is a truly good song too i really do like it um and it's very brutally honest it's really talking about billy corgan's life which i really like Poor Selena of the Vast Oceans is the 13th song. Obviously, very, very long. Um, nine and a half-ish minutes. This song is good. When I first started getting into them, I would watch the YouTube video reviewing all the albums. And when he did this one, he would pick, he would every album he would pick his favorite song. And out of the 28 songs, he picked Poor Selena of the Vast Oceans as his number one. I like it. I like the distortion. I like that it's long. I like that it takes forever to get into the song. I actually do like that. When I first listened to it, I thought, this, I thought the CD was broken. Because funny story is, my dad actually bought the original. I have the original. He bought it in 1995, the double CD. And, uh, or the double album. And I still have it. So some of the songs are messed up. The When it gets into the love section, sometimes it'll skip stuff. Um, and poor Selena... By the time it got to that, and especially, and by the way, when he sang that porcelain of the ocean, like that is so cool. And then even the the heavy guitar when it all comes in, and they actually get into the the rock portion of it. Oh, it's so good! It's so good! It's definitely one of the best parts of the. It's to me, it's not my favorite. It's not my favorite song of this album, or even of this half. It really isn't. Tonight, tonight, and Bullet with Butterfly Wings are probably my two favorite songs. Um, but they are my two favorite. I don't know why I said maybe. Um, Poor Selena is maybe number third because that that song is just very special. Does catch you off guard because it's been a while since you listened to those really really good songs. Then you get all this kind, and it's very. By the way, it's very. He does experiment. I will give him that. You know, songs like Love and songs like An Ode to No One and songs like To Forgive. We've never heard them before. We've never heard any of those kind of songs before, um, especially in the past albums. He never really did that. Um, but in this one, Poor Selena, I mean, it's that's a special song. It comes in, it kind of just punches you in the face, and, and, and it goes from there. And then we end the first part, the first side, with Take Me Down. So this is obviously James Eha. And at this point, this is the second time we've heard him. We heard him in Pisces Iscariot. We technically heard him in Gish, but very, you know, not really a lot. But Take Me Down is from him. And I like this song. I like it a lot. I really like the guitar. He's always been into that kind of sound. And we're going to hear it again, especially with Go and Machina Days, Machina 2. Um, but this song, I like the background. It's very, like, eerie and very, like, dark. Just like the entire album, by the way, but very dark and eerie. But his voice is a kind of, a, kind of really cool to hear and kind of, like, just step away for a second from the 13 songs that we had just heard, or 12 songs, with Billy's voice. So now, obviously, we get a new singer. Uh, again, and it, it, in the main albums, this is the first time we've heard James sing. And his voice is really good. I've always really, really liked his voice. And it's just a very different, very different way of ending it. Who would have thought that they would end it like, like with that? What I will say here is, as an album, if you were to take just the first part of this, just the first half, it is not that strong. It's got an incredible opening, and it's got a very good closing. But the middle gets pretty messy. And, and so if you only took the first CD, this would not be my favorite. And if you only took the first CD, I don't think this would be anybody's top. I don't think this would have sold insanely well. I think it's because of just where they were at the time. I think it's because of the entire package. I think it's because of everything, the experience, all that. As an album, though, 
I like how it starts. I like, especially, I'm not even talking about the first song. I like how it ends. What I will say is listening to it from start to finish, and then if you were to restart it, I do think it works better if you listen from 1 to 14 and restart at 1. What I will say is it doesn't work that well if you start at 14 and then go to 1 on the next uh, CD when you go to the next one. Where boys fear to tread. If you were to start from Take Me Down and go to that song, I do not think it works that well. Um, I think in that case it works in terms of this is a definite end to CD 1. Get ready for a new sound, a new CD for CD 2. That's how I think it's maybe designed. I hope that's how it's designed because I do think it works rather well going from 14 to 1, re-listening to just the first CD. I do think it, it goes in that kind of way, just the sound overall. It gets you ready to re-listen to it. But if you go from the end to the next one, it very much is just like basically any other album where it's like, okay, pause, and then let's begin again. Now, obviously, it's got the same kind of sounds and obviously the same age that they're all in. Um, so it, it does make a little bit more sense that you could go from one to the other. But that's what I'll say about the first one. Second one, let's get into the second one. Again, my favorite, definitely, of the two. The second one, way more consistent. All the songs, much higher quality. Way more of my favorite songs on here. The songs that I really love are on here are much higher than the songs of the other ones. Uh, so let's get into it. So Where Boys Fear to Tread. I like this song. It's a it's a decently long song. It's like four and a half minutes, and I love how it starts. This song is heavy. This song is very heavy, and I really like how it starts with the guitar. Um, and it, it just gets right back in there. This opens very differently than the first uh, CD. The first CD starts obviously with just the piano, then goes to Tonight Tonight, which has the whole melody, has the orchestral stuff, has the guitar parts, but still pretty light. It doesn't really get anywhere in terms of like heavy rock or, or alternative even until you get to Jelly Belly. Here it just starts right away. Then we get to Bodies, and Bodies, holy cow, does that come at you hard. Uh, he screams a lot in Bodies, uh, multiple times since even the Love is Suicide part, he really wants to make that clear. Um, and this song is just so good. I really do like it. I really, really like the guitar parts. Um, I really like his singing. This is a very different kind of singing. This is really like, if you ever wanted to hear when he's at his most nasally, um, and then really the most extreme too, like most very much at you, this is it. This really sends a clear message uh, in terms of the Love is Suicide part. Uh, and, and overall, this is a fantastic song. This is a really, really hard song. Probably, one, probably the most in-your-face song of the entire both albums, I would even argue, maybe. Um, but also, one of the most polished. Like, I truly love this song. And, like, I will listen to just this. I could listen to just this song over and over. It's got that kind of power to it. And speaking of a song you can listen to over and over and over is 33. Let me say this about 33. It's tied for my number one song that Smashing Pumpkins have ever made. The other song is on Machina 2. We'll get to that. I don't want to spoil that. We'll get to that when we get to Machina 2. But this is definitely tied for number one. I can't give either of those songs number one because they're so special. 33 is such a good song. Um, I will listen to him play this live. I will listen to every recording of him playing this live. This is a truly special song to me, especially when you know the meaning. And they even had the storytellers thing in 2000, right before they disbanded, where he told the story about this, how he got his tarot cards read, and they said that uh, when he turns 33 years old, his life is going to majorly change. And at 33 years old is when the group split up. And he was told that back then, back here. And he wrote the song. He was originally going to write 33, 66, 99. He never ended up writing those two songs. I really hope one day he does. I real that's really my number one want with him and the Smashing Pumpkins is one day write 66 and 99. But this song is just so good. His voice honestly doesn't get much better. In a and this is what also makes it special. In an album where his voice is nasally and is not really clean. Siamese Dream, his voice is pretty clean. Gish, it's pretty clean. Adore, he really tried. And tried as in like he really sang. And in Machina, obviously it goes back to kind of like this. But in an album that's like this, with songs like literally right before it, Bodies, which is just so heavy, and him just screaming, 
and it doesn't sound that well polished. Then we get to this song, and it's beautiful. The guitar, the instrumental portion is top of the class. It's, it's not just tied for my first song by them. 33 is tied for my first song in any band, ever. Um, I love that song so much. I can listen to it. I have listened to it just, oh, like, I can listen to it five, six, seven, eight times in a row. That's how much I love it. Um, it it's so good. It's so good. And, and again, this is a song that I like to listen to him play a lot. I was waiting. I saw him a couple times. He didn't play this. The last time I saw him in the OG La La tour, he played 33 live. And actually, I was made because that's the song I needed to hear him play live, um, along with the other song, but I don't think he'll ever play that version of the song, and there's, I guess, the hint to that other song. But 33, Jesus, it's such a good song. In the Arms of Sheep is next, and this is a unique song. This song very often gets passed by by me, and I think the placing of it is definitely in a bad spot, because it's right in between 33 and 1979, literally some of my fit, my two of the top three favorite songs they've ever made. And this song gets stuck directly in between. But it does fit the mood. This is definitely a like an interlude in the album where it's like, let's just take a break. Let's talk about some different topics. Let's really change it into more of like a poppy feel, like pop. Let's, you know, make it more melody driven. Let's get his voice and really have his voice shine. And this fits that. It's a slower song. It's acoustic. It's got like the background melody that sounds really, really like calming. It's got his voice that that's that's pretty solid as well. This is a really good song. It just is in a bad spot. That's all. Number five, 1979. Again, what can you say about this song that hasn't been said? This is the song that probably launched. This is the song that sold this album, this entire album, 1979. The most radio play time. A song they play live every single time, along with Bullet with Butterfly Wings. A song that's very different from Bullet with Butterfly Wings. A song talking about Billy Corgan growing up as a child in 1979. And this song is just super good. Obviously, the guitar part is one of the most unique things and, and, and again, legendary. Much like Zero, even like Tonight Tonight, those three are really, really good. And even Bullet with Butterfly Wings. But 1979 obviously has just such the really cool guitar part that really... If you learn how to play the guitar and you're into 90s music or you've ever listened to Smashing Pumpkins, you probably want to play 1979 because it's so special. But this song, it's my second favorite. It's not tied for second. It is my second favorite. Beautiful song. Beautiful song. Listen to him play alive all the time. Just like 33. Listen to him play alive all the time. Can listen to it over and over and over and over again. I just don't know what gives 33 the advantage, but it definitely does have an advantage on it. Tales of a Scorched Earth is at number six, and here's what I'll say about that song. Skip. This is the song. When I'm listening to the Smashing Pumpkins, I don't dislike any other songs, except for this song. I just don't get it. I can't actually listen to most of it. It's got the sound of love, the distortion, but it's got the heaviness of I don't even know what, of bodies, of something. It's just so heavy. It's got him screaming. It just doesn't work. The distortion and the heavy intensity that he's playing with does not work for this song, literally whatsoever. This is the only song I do not like from the Smashing Pumpkins, and it's kind of weird that it lies on this album, and it's still my favorite album sometimes, um, but that's just how it goes. Through the Eyes of Ruby is next number seven. This is a really good song. This has some really, really nice guitar parts. This has some really nice singing. This has a really nice just band feel. He's played, he played this live uh, really for the first time in a long time when he went on the Manson tour with Marilyn Manson. And this is a really good song live and a really good song there as well. This is when we start to flip it back. This is kind of, again, the experimental portion, the middle portion of this album, which does the same thing in a way as the middle part of the last album, but it does it more consistently. Other than Tales of a Scorched Earth, we get 1979, and then we get this one, and this song holds up extremely well. Then we get the Stumbling, which is, again, this one's darker. This one's very dark, but it's got the acoustic feel that 33, 1979, like those have. It's got that kind of feel to it, um, but it's definitely a darker song overall. Uh, talking a lot about just bad drugs, single parent, like a lot of a lot of stuff. Um, but definitely a good song. I actually really, really like this song. I'd like to learn how to play it 
on guitar, but it's, it's got a really unique kind of guitar sound to it. And then we get to XYU. There's no coming back from XYU. Uh, this song is probably the most heavy, long, very, uh, I was going to say heavy again, because that's really the only word I can use to explain it. But no, when, when they come back around like more than halfway through the song, and it gets super, super fast and super heavy. And then he just goes into the weird guitar noises again that he makes, which I'm pretty sure is him pushing on, not the neck, but the top, like where the string goes into and you turn it with the, the knob. He's pressing on that and he's playing things. And if you press on it, which you really shouldn't do, <laughs> it creates very unique, and obviously all the whatever pedals he has on, it creates a very very messy but unique sound I guess and uh, he's done that live and that's what he does and Jesus so the song is pretty darn good I really really do like the song and it kind of signifies the end like this is it because the next song switches completely we only come out at night is right after it and this is it right XYU is the end of the rock smashing pumpkins the heavy in your face rock of Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. We only come out at night, changes things. It's more experimental, it's got more different sounds to it, it's got different kind of guitar sounds to it, it's got more of a drum machine in the background, and I do really like this song actually. It kind of, uh, it's talking about them, really, it's talking about them performing. We only come out at night, the days are much too bright, all that kind of stuff. It, it kind of rely, it kind of connects to me just in the way that I'm basically a human vampire and that I don't really like to go outside. So it's funny that, I mean, I connect to it, but definitely not for the right reason or the same reason that he's singing it for, but I really do like this song a lot. Beautiful is next. Again, you got the really cool drum machine. This is, the ending of this album, I would have assumed at the time, would be very iffy to people. Because it's like, well, we've only really known one kind of Smashing Pumpkins, and now you're giving us this really weird, like, 1979 is very pop. We Only Come Out at Night isn't exactly pop, but it's not rock. And then we get Beautiful, which is definitely not rock, but really, really good. It's got guitar parts to it. It's got really, really nice singing. It's a pretty nice song if you're singing it to somebody else. So it's, it's a cool song, but again, just a very, uh, he, they take it over here. It was over here, and they take it over here towards the end of the album, and I really, really like that. Lily is the next song, my one and only, in parentheses. Um, and this is a cool song. This is one of the most unique sounding songs. Firstly, I really like how it sounds. It's, it opens up as if it is from Kingdom Hearts. If you guys know what Kingdom Hearts is, it opens up like it's from Kingdom Hearts. Um, but the song is really, really good, and it's more stalkery-like. I mean, it's basically talking about how he loves somebody, but he's kind of confused. He, he likes two different people, and he knows that because he watches them from a tree, like outside their window. He sees another person with them, and he wonders like if they like that person or him. Um, at, towards the end, even where he gets arrested, how he says like, "I know you love me," uh, as they're dragging me away. I, I swear I saw her raise her hand and wave goodbye. That's the ending of it, and that's funny. This is, and they even talk about the he even talks about the police. Um, so he basically is like stalking in the song, whoever this character is, is stalking a person, thinks they love them, thinks they love that person back, eventually gets to the point where literally they have to arrest him or take him away from her, um, and that she waves goodbye, but that's not saying that she loves him, that's maybe saying like, you know, get lost. So I think it's, it's a pretty comical in a way, that could be that could be really weird to say. Very comical way of uh, analyzing the song, but it's really, if you've listened to this, I haven't really analyzed super deep any of the songs besides this one because this song is just so unique in that way. Um, it, Adore has one of them too, and we're definitely going to get to that in Adore, but I really like this song, if nothing else, than the craziness and the over-the-top kind of lyrics to it. And then we finally get the last song, Farewell and Good Night. And this song is very special for a couple of reasons. One, I love the title. I love the title because it really signifies the end of the album. Farewell and good night. Uh, it also it signifies the end. The end of what? The end of at that point. The end of the album. The end of the Smashing Pumpkins in 1995. You know that kind of thing. A closing. 
But when you listen to it now and you think farewell and good night, it, it seems like a goodbye. And the song is sung as if it's a goodbye. And I really like that. The song is kind of, sh again, like I said, just said it as a goodbye, but it's a way of them, in a way, kind of like thanking you, but like bidding you, like, see ya, like, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to what we did here. This was a ton of fun. We all worked together. What I didn't mention in the beginning, good time to mention it now, this album was very different when they recorded it. They all worked together. You know, there were two, uh, two recording studios. Billy was working in one, along with like composing the songs, but they also were recording. James and Darcy and Jimmy were all recording. This was an album that Billy did not do 95% of the work. Everybody did it. And you can really tell, obviously. I mean, there's different. Uh, uh, James comes in multiple times this album. Darcy is in Beautiful and in this. And that's another reason why I love this song. Farewell and Good Night is one of their better songs ever. It's got all four of them. They're all singing. Jane, or Jimmy even sings. Um, and it's really, really cool. And then they mix. Like, Jimmy and Darcy sing. And then eventually they sing together. And James and Billy. And then they, they all come together at the end. And listening to this one live, they do, there's not many recordings on YouTube of them singing this one live. But when you find it and you listen to it, it's really special. And I would freaking guarantee that if Darcy was on this tour, they would end with that. In fact, I would want them to end with that because there's really no song that brings them all together like this song. And again, just bringing them all together, having them all be able to sing and be a part of something, and then the, just the message of farewell and good night. Again, really sung even as if they're on stage and saying like, thanks guys, like thanks for being here. Thanks for being our fans. We appreciate it. We bid you good night, right? We'll see you next time. That's what the song means. And I really, really love that. It's, it's one of the most powerful meanings. It's got all of them together. I love hearing their voice. James has a really good voice. Darcy, obviously, really love her voice. Wish she sang more. Uh, obviously, she sang in Daydream and Gish. Uh, she didn't really sing anything in Siamese Dream. She sings this. And she's in Adore quite often as like the backing vocalist, which I really like. And I think that adds to Adore overall, that it's not Billy singing on top of Billy like he always is, which I love. I love, but I also would like... Billy on singing out of Billy and Darcy. I really like that mix because she has a good voice that complements his. More studio maybe than actual when they're playing live, um, but they their voices definitely work really well together. And that's it. That is my review for Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. Super long. Maybe there's one person that's made it this far uh, in the entire thing, but thank you for whoever is still watching this for watching. Make sure Leave in the comments below anything you guys want me to talk about Smashing Pumpkins related, anything for the future. Next time we're going to be reviewing Adore, cannot wait, love that album, we'll be doing the exact same thing, talking about the history, how it came together, all that stuff. So super, super excited to do Adore. I'm sure when I listen to it I will come back and say that that is my favorite album that they've ever made. But thank you guys so much for watching this review. I will see you in two weeks for the Adore review.